Signals. Could mean everything. Could mean nothing. Interpreting a signal correctly could mean the difference between life and death. For example, failure to properly detect CO2 aboard a manned spacecraft will quickly become disastrous for the crew. Detecting molecules accurately is a challenging task. It becomes more challenging when it has to be done remotely and from a fast-moving platform. A signal may not be unique for a molecule we're trying to detect, but even if it is, there's the issue with correlating the signal with a specific location in 3D space while the spacecraft is moving through space. So when a signal that represents an important item for space exploration is detected, we need to make sure that there is a high probability that the signal in fact represents the assumed phenomenon at the assumed location at the assumed time in the real world. On 14 November 2008, the Indian spacecraft Chandrayaan-1 sent by Israel released the moon impact probe while in orbit of the moon. 25 minutes later, it would crash into the moon as planned at 1.7 kilometers per second and totally be destroyed. But on its way down, it directly detected water vapor. This was the first time a direct and reliable measurement of water vapor in the atmosphere of the moon was made. Considering the fact that the moon has an extremely thin atmosphere, in conjunction with a limited time of less than 25 minutes to collect data, the instrument that collected this data did an extremely good job. This instrument was the Chandra's Altitudinal Composition Explorer, or CHASE for short. But how did CHASE sense this aspect of our universe? Here on, now precisely here, the separation happens. So there you go. This is the animation of the separation. Access to large amounts of water is a key requirement for any human settlement. It doesn't matter if it's a big city, a small village, or a research outpost in Antarctica. Water being fairly dense requires a lot of energy to transport. So a human settlement needs to be as close as possible to the source of water. On celestial bodies without oceans or rivers, water may be available only in a few locations. And those locations will most likely be the place where the first off-world human outpost will be established. We just have to make sure that there's actually water there. It has long been suspected that there's some amount of water on the moon, but the total amount and location is something that is being researched at this time. That's why finding by Israel and other space agencies are so important for the potential colonization of our moon. Detecting and subsequently measuring a phenomenon is the most common task performed by all deep space spacecraft. The CHASE instrument on board the Moon Impact Probe launched by Chandrayaan-1 was in part designed to directly detect molecules. To detect the molecules, a scientific instrument called Quadrupole Mass Analyzer was used. Before we go into the specifics, let's take a brief look at what the Quadrupole Mass Analyzer, or more precisely, a Quadrupole Mass Spectrometer is. Let's first start with just the spectrometer, or spectrometer if you like. A spectrometer is a scientific device that measures a continuous spectrum of a physical phenomenon. For example, measuring the intensity of each color in a visible light beam. This is done with an optical spectrometer. The spectrum that we're interested in, however, is something that is more obvious than the colors hidden in visible light. We're interested in the mass spectrum. Every piece of matter has a mass. This by itself is not enough to identify a compound because 
every piece of matter has a mass. If we take into consideration the volume that the matter occupies, we end up with the density of the piece of matter. This definitely is not the same across all matter, but is far from being unique to a specific compound. Many compounds share similar densities, and more importantly, density varies with temperature and pressure, especially when it comes to the water vapor we're trying to detect, or gas in general. But if we make certain assumptions, and those assumptions turn out to be correct, then this will help us later design a device that's much better, reliable, and accurate at identifying unknown materials. The Greeks made this assumption in the 5th century BCE. The assumption was that every piece of matter is made of indivisible small particles. These particles had to obviously be too small to be seen by the naked eye. Thus, the concept of the Greek atom was born. The Greek atomic concept was very different than the one we use today. For one, Greek atoms had various geometric shapes and had unique behaviors. In fact, the only surviving aspect of the Greek atom is that at some point, matter is indivisible. It would take us until the early 20th century for us to get strong evidence for the existence of these indivisible atoms. Aside from the fact that we end up splitting them a few decades after their discovery, most matter is stable at the atomic level. And this is the key that makes the mass spectrometer possible. An individual atom or molecule will have a certain mass, but also a certain charge if we ionize it. And the ratio between them is known as the mass to charge ratio. It will form the basis of uniquely identifying unknown matter in our spectrometer. By itself, a single mass to charge ratio may not be unique enough to identify a specific element or molecule, but a mass to charge ratio spectrum, or more properly, a mass spectrum, will form a more unique signature of the unknown matter. This can then be compared against mass spectrum of known matter. If a match is not found, then software can be used to simulate possible ways the detection process could have fragmented the unknown molecules and what the mass spectrum would look like. The fact that the mass spectrum is dealing with matter on the atomic level means that it can detect and analyze extremely small quantities of matter exactly the environment we expect to find in the extremely thin atmosphere of the moon. With the basic concept of the mass spectrometer explained, let's now look at the specific type used in CHASE, the quadrupole mass spectrometer. The operational concept of a quadrupole mass spectrometer is fairly simple. An unknown substance is fed into an ionizer. This ionizes the atoms or molecules of the substance, making them electrically charged. In some instances, the ionization process will cause the molecule to fragment to smaller pieces. But in both cases, we now have ionized particles. These particles are then accelerated by an ion accelerator and introduced into the mass filter section. After the filter section, they are then detected by an ion detector. But let's go back to the filter section because this is where things get a little complicated. And this is where you'll also see the technical brilliance of the quadrupole mass spectrometer. This might take a while. All right, let's dive in. We start with four metal rods, two in the horizontal plane and two in the vertical plane. At one end of the rods is an ion detector. The stream of charged particles is introduced at the other end and enters between all four rods. I'm now going to start at the basic ways that the rods are used and how they would affect the stream of charged particles, then gradually add complexity until we arrive at how they work in actual operation. Let's start with the stream of ionized particles and let's assume that they're all positively charged. They don't have to be. This stream will flow through a box that's currently empty and out the other side into an ion detector. A quick note on ion detectors. There are many kinds of ion detectors, but the one we are using in this example is an electron multiplier. 
This detector works in the following way. When an ion hits a sensor in the detector, it knocks off secondary electrons. These secondary electrons hit the next sensor in the chain, knocking off even more secondary electrons. The beam of secondary electrons becomes stronger and stronger after each interaction with a sensor. Eventually, this beam of electrons is sent to an electronic circuit that measures its intensity or current. So that's how an electron multiplier ion detector works. Now back to our empty box. We will now add only one of the four metal rods and see what happens. If we apply a positive voltage to the rod, then the stream of positive ions will be repelled by the rod and it will hit the side of the box. The detector sees nothing. If we apply a negative voltage to the rod, then the stream of positive ions will be attracted to the rod and will hit it. The detector, once again, sees nothing. So one charged rod is clearly not enough to create any kind of detector that can help us. Let's add another rod on our first rod and add some spacing between them. We will also electrically tie the two rods together so they will have the same voltage on them. Starting with the stream of positive ions again, they will hit the detector when the rods are not electrically charged. When the rods are negatively charged, they will attract the positive ions and none will hit the detector just like in the one rod setup. However, if the rods are positively charged, then they will each repel the positive ions forcing them to the middle of the tube and away from the rods. The stream will therefore hit the detector. We realize that changing the polarity on the two rods will affect whether or not the ion stream is detected. Interesting. Now let's try something different. Instead of a stream, let's start with a bundle of ions with different mass to charge ratios. For simplicity, they all have the same charge but different masses. As the bundle of ions move through the tube, a positively charged set of rods will keep them in the center and they will hit the detector. But now, if we make the rods negative and try again, something interesting happens. None of the ions will hit the detector as expected, but they will hit the rods at distinct points. Why is that? It's because a more massive object has a lower acceleration than a less massive object given the same force. Now we're getting somewhere. When the ions are in the middle of the rod, the repelling forces from the two positive rods somewhat cancel each other out in the middle of the two, and the path of the ions will more or less not be affected. If the ions are off-center, the repelling forces from the two positive rods will be unbalanced, creating a net force that will force the ions towards the center. Because of inertia, less massive ions, or more precisely, ions with smaller mass-to-charge ratios will be pushed towards the center line a lot faster than ions with bigger mass to charge ratios. And this time difference is the key for detecting specific molecules based on their mass to charge ratio. We return to our previous two rod setup, but instead of a steady voltage on the rods, we will apply an alternating voltage. It's momentarily positive and then negative over time. We're basically applying a sine wave voltage on the rods. When the voltage is zero, the ions are unaffected. When it becomes negative, the ions will start to move to either the top or bottom rod. If the voltage is switched to positive before the ions hit the rods, they will start to move towards the center again. If they pass the center line far enough before the voltage goes negative again, then the process will repeat itself and the ions will never hit the rods as they move towards the detector. But this will only work for ions that aren't fast enough to hit the rods during the time that the rods were negatively charged. These would be ions with high mass to charge ratios. So essentially, this setup would only allow ions that are above a certain mass to charge ratio to reach the detector. If we add a positive offset to our sine wave voltage, that is, the voltage spends more time being positive than being negative, and also increase the frequency, then things will play out even better. 
particles will spend more time being pushed towards the center, making the system a much better filter. Here's why. Before, we relied on ions with a smaller mass to charge ratio hitting the rods during part of a single cycle. That is the time when the sine wave voltage is negative. The voltage required to cut off these smaller ions will also cut off ions with slightly bigger mass to charge ratio. This makes the cutoff not so sharp. That is, the cutoff between what gets caught and what goes through the filter is not clean cut. It's blurry. But with the voltage offset, we can reduce the overall voltage so that the smaller ions won't hit the rods during a single cycle, but drift towards them during a series of cycles as they travel through the tube. The cutoff now is also more abrupt because it's not just about the voltage, it's also about maintaining a stable path through the tube. And this stability is related to the frequency of our sine wave. Because of the speed at which these ions move, the frequency of the alternating voltage is in the radio frequency range, typically between 500 kilohertz to two megahertz. With all that said, we now have a usable high pass mass to charge ratio filter. It will allow only ions above a certain mass to charge ratio to pass through to the detector. With the first two rods aligned vertically, we'll now add the final two rods to our setup and align them horizontally. But this time, instead of the two new rods being directly connected to the line that connects the first two rods, these ones, although they are connected to each other, they are connected to the line through a voltage inverter. That is, when the voltage on the first set of rods is positive, the voltage on the second set of rods will be negative and vice versa. Since the voltage is mostly positive on the first set of rods, it will be mostly negative on the second set of rods. Let's temporarily disconnect the first set of rods. Now, the second set of rods, being mostly negative, will have the following effect on our positively charged particles. Particles with a high mass to charge ratio will move a shorter distance than particles with a lower mass to charge ratio. However, since the voltage is mostly negative, the positive ions have more time to be attracted to the rods than repelled by it during the short positive portion. The high mass to charge ratio particles will not have moved far enough during the positive voltage time to fully cancel out the distance moved during the negative voltage time. The end result is that these particles will drift towards the second set of rods over time and never hit the detector. For particles with low mass to charge ratio, they move fast enough that they will cancel out their movement towards the rods during the limited time that the voltage is positive. The end result is that these particles will not drift towards the rods because their path through the tube will be stable. They will thus hit the detector. So now, the second set of rods acts like a low pass mass to charge ratio filter. If we now turn back on the first set of rods, which operates as a high pass mass to charge ratio filter, its effect will be combined with the effect of the second set of rods, which operates as a low pass mass to charge ratio filter. This combination effectively creates a high quality band pass filter, which can be tuned to a single mass to charge ratio value, effectively detecting a specific molecule. All the authorizations are being given, Nine, all the parameters eight, are in seven, good shape, six, vehicle is good health. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Plus one, yes. plus two. The vehicle has been cut off. 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 Ignition sequence normal and lift off normal. Auto tracking. Yes, the motor is also running. Speed to tracking. I hope that didn't take too long explaining how the quadrupole mass spectrometer works. But sadly, this was only a basic explanation of the complex interaction between voltage, ions, frequencies, and rods. But now that we know the basic operation of a quadrupole mass spectrometer, let's move on and talk about how it was used inside Chase. 
by changing the frequency and intensity on the mass spectrometer over time to tune for certain mass to charge ratios, Chase was able to detect and create a mass spectrum of a broad range. Each sweep took 4 seconds and spanned the range of 1 to 100 AMU. 1 AMU is equals to 1 twelfth the mass of a carbon 12 atom, or 1.66054 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. A really, really, really small amount. When measuring gas composition in an ultra-low pressure environment such as the atmosphere of the moon, outgassing becomes a problem. Outgassing is the process in which absorbed or trapped gases are released from a material. The rate of outgassing is increased when the ambient pressure is lowered or the temperature is increased. And when the outgassing occurs in a closed environment like a car, the outgassed material will accumulate leading to that new car smell that some people are familiar with. This is caused by some of the material used in the interior of the car releasing certain chemicals used in their manufacturing process. Over time, these gases build up to a level where the smell is strong enough to be detected by a person. The same thing can happen to instruments like our mass spectrometer on the spacecraft. When this happens, it becomes more difficult to determine which molecules originated externally and which ones were outgassed by the very instrument or the spacecraft itself. In fact, attempt to measure the atmospheric composition of the moon during the Apollo era resulted in the instrument periodically being saturated due to outgassing. One way Chase was able to reduce the effect of outgassing was the fact that it was in the space environment longer than the Apollo mission before reaching the moon. Apollo took about three days and Chandrayaan-1 took three weeks. This was done to save fuel and reduce costs, but it also helped reduce outgassing. The longer a spacecraft is in space, the more time it has to vent all of the material being outgassed. Another way Chase was able to reduce the effect of outgassing is to take advantage of the fact that it was in motion on a trajectory towards the surface of the moon when it was turned on. This helped to differentiate the steady stream of outgassed molecules caused by the spacecraft and instruments, which were always there, from molecules which were encountered in the external environment and varied as the spacecraft moved through the ultra-thin atmosphere of the moon. In contrast, the Apollo atmospheric sensors were placed on the moon by astronauts, so they only measured the atmosphere from a single location. Chase was part of the moon impact probe, which itself was a mini spacecraft attached to Chandrayaan-1. The moon impact probe was released by Chandrayaan-1 on 14 November 2008. 25 minutes later, it crashed into the moon as planned. During the descent of the moon impact probe and Chase, Chase detected three masses consistently more than all others. They varied with altitude and location, but were always higher than all of the others. These masses were 18, 44, and 28. The masses are measured in atomic mass units, AMU, by the mass spectrometer. The first mass, 18, is the most important for this video. The mass of hydrogen is 1. The mass of oxygen is 16. So a molecule of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom would give us a molecule with the mass of 18. And that molecule would be water, H2O. But instead of water, maybe it's just a single atom of O18, a heavier isotope of normal oxygen, so it's not even water at all. Or maybe it's nitrogen helium, NHE. Nitrogen is 14 and helium is 4, or some other combination of atoms that would get us to 18. These other combinations would not be possible because molecules can only form in a certain way and the charge would most likely be different. Remember. It's the ratio of mass to charge we're detecting, not just the mass. In addition, the absence of certain other peaks helps eliminate false identification. This all shows that the probability of the unknown molecule being water is really, really high if we see a peak of 18 on a mass spectrum. And if we take that probability within the context of what we already know about the moon, then we're certain, as close to certainty we can ever get, that it is water. In science, 
We can never be 100% certain of anything, but we can be 100% certain in the practical sense. The direct detection of water vapor in the atmosphere of the moon by Chandrayaan-1 and ISRO continues to add important data to the pool of knowledge we'll be relying on when we plan our future moon bases. In fact, another instrument carried by Chandrayaan-1 and built by NASA also detected water on the moon using a completely different detection method and a different kind of instrument. The Moon Mineralogy Mapper is an imaging spectrometer, and it too added data to our water knowledge pool of the moon. Now, over 13 years later, spacecraft, landers, and rovers are still adding new data to this knowledge pool. The Chinese lander, Chang'e 5, sent by CNSA, made the first measurement of water in the lunar soil from the lunar surface. All around us, we receive signals from the furthest corner of the universe. All at once, all the time. With all this data traffic, we must first control the flow, sending certain data only to certain instruments. And just like the traffic light helps us get around a city safely, sending signals to the right instrument will help us find a safe location on some distant world that we can colonize. I'm DexDFX for sensing the universe.